Well, good evening, folks. We're glad to welcome you all to worship tonight. And just to remind you, our short time of prayer at the close of the service, just after the benediction, we need to pray for just uh, 10 minutes or so, and then there's a cup of tea and coffee. Service next Lord's Day at the usual times. Uh, God willing, I'll be on holiday next Lord's Day, and uh, Johnny Fitzsimons will be conducting both services, God willing. We're here to worship God, and our first song of worship uh, Psalm 122, a song about going to church, a song about delighting in the presence of God in the Old Testament setting that people were going up to Jerusalem. Um, but we look at it today through the Church of Jesus Christ. What a blessed thing to gather uh, to praise God's great name. Psalm 122, we sing these six verses to God's praise. They say to me, sung to your prayers, words that our Saviour Jesus Christ would have sung in his own tongue in Aramaic uh, so long ago. We bless you, mighty God, that what is spoken of in this psalm is fulfilled in him, the one who brought peace, the one who brought salvation to sinners such as us, the one who unites men and women who would be naturally uh, far apart, the one who makes friends and brothers in the church of Jesus Christ. We bless you today that he has been building his church across the world. Lord, we're sad that in our part of the world it seems that the building of the church is slow and not much signs at times of many entering into the kingdom. But we thank you that across the world today, in different countries, that the church of Jesus Christ has been expanding with great numbers today. Your church has been built upon this earth. We long and pray that there'll come again days of of great building in our own land, in our own province. And we pray, Father, as we hear your word tonight, that you'd build up our own hearts and our following of Jesus Christ. We pray you'd forgive us, Lord, from our many sins, the sins of today. 
not loved you, we've not followed you, we've not served you as we might have. We have been thoughtless of others. Uh, we've been self-seeking. Pardon us from all our sins. And we ask, Father, that you would bless all who've gathered here this evening. Thank you for those who've come in. Thank you for this opportunity to praise you together. Think of those, Lord God, who uh, are not able to be here tonight. And we ask, Lord, your blessing upon them as well. We ask it all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, on, our, uh, on the Lord's Day evenings each week, for a number of weeks, we've been looking at Psalm 23, surely the most well-known part of the Bible. And we're going to read that 23rd Psalm again. And then we're going to turn in the New Testament to read from 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, to read some verses there as well. So let's first of all give our attention to God's Word as we find it in Psalm 23. You will see the title tells us it was a Psalm of David. <coughs> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then turning over into the New Testament to 1 Peter chapter 5 we read the opening 11 verses. And this is again the word of God. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, Strengthen and establish you. To him be the dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Well, before we come to look at our psalm again this evening, we're, we sing praise to God. We turn to uh, the words of Psalm 79, uh, the verses Mark 8 to 12. God of our salvation, help and glorious your name make. Deliver us, forgive our sins even for your own name's sake. You see that little phrase coming up in our verse tonight, that God does things for his own name's sake. Psalm 79, 8 to 12, and sing his praise once more.
God and our Father in heaven, we gather to worship you tonight. We gather to hear your word. We acknowledge our need, Lord, that you would speak to us. We thank you that you do that, not in an audible voice, but that you do that every time we hear the scriptures read. It's you speaking to us. We thank you that throughout the millennia, you've been speaking to men and women in the 23rd Psalm. We thank you that little children have learned the words of this song before they, they could even read them. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that they have been the solace and the comfort of your people in old age, of your people going through the greatest troubles and trials of life. We thank you, Father, for how familiar these words are to so many. And yet we ask you, mighty God, that with the familiarity of these words, that you would help us each one this evening not to miss what you would want to say to us. So we ask, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear your word, that you give us minds to understand it and to think about it and ponder it, and that in the working of your spirit, you would shape our lives by the words that we look at this evening. Lord, you have been the shepherd of your people through the ages, the faithful one, the one who always provides for his sheep. We thank you for all the provision that you've given to us in our lives. We have health and strength and reasonable measure to be here tonight. We have freedom to worship you. We give you thanks for these provisions. We thank you for all the, the abilities and gifts that you've entrusted to us, as well as resources financially. And we thank you that in the life of the church, you give us the opportunity and privilege to use of what you have given to us for things that will last for all eternity. And so, Lord, we ask that you would take the little things of our lives. We offer them back to you. And we pray that just as you took a little boy's lunch of a few rolls and some fish and made them a great feast for many, so that you would use of what we give to you for the blessing of people in this community and to the ends of the earth. Lord, come amongst us now and work in the might of your spirit. Comfort us where we need comfort. Correct us and challenge us where we need that too. For we ask it all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, we don't have a, a big chapter of the Bible to think about as we've had uh, in past months as we've worked our way through the book of Numbers. We're just coming to the, the same paragraph of the Bible week after week and verse by verse. So you've just got one sentence in the Bible to think about, to chew over this evening as you worship God. And it's in the words in verse 3. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That's what you're to engage with this evening. Those words on the page before you. And of course, there's something about the word restore, isn't there? Even as you reflect on that, it's a very encouraging word. Something broken that's going to be mended. Something that's no longer able to be used in the way that it was designed to be used. And it's going to be sorted out and used in a fresh way. Maybe you've had a favourite family heirloom and you've kept it. And you eventually got it restored. And it means the world to you. Maybe you've had a relationship. And it's been marred. And there have been struggles with it. And in the, by the grace of God. It's been restored. And you're thankful to God for that. <coughs> and I think it's fair to say that all of us this evening. If we were honest and open. Would say that there are aspects of all our lives. Where we need God's hand. Of restoration. Give something that even that word restoration, restore, resonates with in your mind. Well, hear these words again about our God. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Isn't it a wonderful song? It's been praised by the followers of Jesus for three millennia. 3,000 years. David lived about 1,000 BC and here we are in 2023, 20, 
3,000 years, this simple paragraph of the Bible has been blessing the lives of many. We saw that the opening line of this psalm is the great uh, heading to it all, that great cry of faith, the Lord is my shepherd. And that's the psalmist's confession, that's the testimony of his life. He says, this is the thing about me that is the most important thing of all, that the Lord is my shepherd. Isn't that a wonderful thing to be able to say? Many people could say all sorts of things about their lives. Could be a footballer and you've now gone to the German leagues and you're going to earn a fortune. But for the Christian, isn't it so much, so much better? The Lord is my shepherd. And having given this great statement of his faith, the rest of the psalm is filled with, uh, and is loaded with life-transforming statements, one after the other. This, says David, is my experience of God in my life. And that's something for you to, just to, to think about a little bit as we begin. The Christian faith is not merely knowing the facts about Jesus Christ. The Christian faith our Reformed Protestant faith is a life of knowing God, of being in a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, to, be, to, be, to well up with joy and to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And David is telling us all of the ways that this great shepherd had blessed his life. So what did... This believing King David writes about God's work in his life in this third verse. Well, there are three things that you can reflect on and think about as we ponder these words. David, first of all, says that the good shepherd restores his sheep. The good shepherd restores his sheep. I have known a few shepherds in my lifetime when I ministered up outside London Derry and when I ministered right, uh, in Dremore uh, and I picked up some things from them. I remember my first congregation I was going to be preaching in John 10 and I went to a man in my congregation and said, now, I'm going to say this about sheep and uh, correct me if I'm wrong so that I've got these facts right. So I know a little bit about sheep. Uh, I've spoken to a few experts and apparently when a sheep rolls over on its back uh, the word is it's cast. Uh, we sometimes use cast with the dog and it's casting its hair. But when a sheep it's cast, it's this big fat yo and it's got its full fleece on and uh, it's got into a little hollow and maybe tried to uh, bend down as sheep do in their front legs and uh, to nibble some grass. And uh, because the, sheep, uh, the fleece is so full, the whole centre of gravity has changed and the poor sheep rolls over and there it is on its back with its legs stuck up in the air. It's cast. And no matter how much the sheep wriggles, it can't get back on its feet. Well, that's difficult enough in our climates, uh, in our temperate climate, with a little rain for the sheep to negotiate on its back. But in the Middle East, for a sheep to be cast, it was the end of its life. It would lie there in the blazing Palestine heat. It would soon be dehydrated and it would be a goner. The vultures would have been circling in the air <coughs> watching another sheep and waiting for dinner time. And the only hope of a, of, a, of a sheep that was cast was an attentive shepherd. Coming along, pushing the sheep over and apparently a shepherd not only would, would right the sheep he would know that with his poor little legs stuck up in the air, the circulation wouldn't be that good. And he would get hands on and he would rub their limbs till there was eventually some circulation and the sheep could eventually go skipping off. Maybe David was thinking of many times when he'd righted the sheep and rubbed their limbs and got them going again. And he thinks of his own life and he says of his shepherd the Lord, he restores my soul. Literally, the, the little phrase there at the start of verse 3 was, He brings back my soul. That's the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of his sheep. That's what he does in the very, very first instance when someone becomes a Christian. He restores my soul, the Christian can say. 
You see, when sin came into the world, the, the lives of men and women were turned upside down. We were made to live for God and enjoy God and serve God forever. What blessing there would be. But man sinned and every human being since is all upside down, serves himself far from God. No peace with God. And here's this good shepherd comes along and he restores my soul. He fixes what's broken in the sinner's heart and life. He gives to the sheep what the sheep needs more than anything else. Pardon from their sin and to be declared right with God. And David says, this is my experience. The Lord has come and he's turned my life right side up. He's restored my soul. Another trans possible translation of this opening line is, he causes my life to return. And having done that for his sheep in the first instance and making someone one of his own sheep, the Lord continues to do that for his sheep right throughout our days. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ this evening, this will be the experience of your life. The good shepherd has restored my soul. He's done it in the first instance in saving me and every day he's at this work restoring my soul, causing my life to return. How does he do that? How does, how does the Christian experience that? Well, he restores his, his, his sheep when he returns wandering sheep. Uh, it's not a very flattering picture of us, is it really, to be a sheep? Uh, they're not known for their intelligence. They tend to wander. If it's one out of the field, it's all out. And as David reviewed his life, he said, this is my story. He restores my soul. He returned me from wandering. Was David thinking about that wandering in his life when he committed sin with Bathsheba and then uh, saw and plotted the death of Uriah? Oh, how upside down his life was again. But God came and he restored him. He, he brought to him the prophet Nathan. He spoke to him and so David's thinking of all the ways that he has been returned by God from his wanderings. That's what the good shepherd does. You think of Peter, the apostle Peter. God had restored him and saved him, but he wandered off in denying his God. And the good shepherd came and he restored his soul. He, he, he gave him that experience again of knowing the Lord with him in his life, that he was pardoned from all his sin. The good shepherd restores his sheep. How you find that, Christian? What's been the testimony of your life? Has it not been this, that having restored me in the first instance, it's something that he's kept on doing? Some of us can think very clearly of times as a sheep in Christ's flock, we began to wander. We began to diverge from the path of following him. We slacked off in following him. And didn't we find? But he came again. And he turned us right side up and onto the path of following him. He returns wandering sheep. Uh, you could be here this evening as a Christian and it, it looks to everybody else that you're a sheep going on great. But inside you, you know you've been wandering. And this psalm is him coming to restore you his sheep. Not only does he return wandering sheep in his restoration, but he revives weak sheep. As I said, another translation might be, he causes my life to return. You think of the sheep in Palestine. All the tough paths that they had to follow. The wind and the heat. And the sheep would be weary and struggling. They would feel like giving up. And David was saying, I was like that so often in my life. And he restored my soul. Hasn't that been your, your, your life, Christian? There have been moments in my life, the Christian says, when I've been ailing spiritually, when I haven't been strong and following Jesus Christ, and this shepherd didn't leave me like that, he came and he revived me a weak sheep. The Bible's full of illustrations of God's people who were saying in their lives, I don't think I can face another day. Christians say that too. Don't, don't think if, you, if you're not a Christian yet and you become a Christian that all of life's troubles will be solved. No, Christians have difficulties and challenges to face. 
There's Jacob in the Old Testament. He had so many troubles as a, as a follower of the Lord. God had saved him wonderfully and restored him. And his life is full of so many troubles. His, he thinks his precious son Joseph is dead. He thinks he's about to lose another son. And on one occasion in Genesis 42 he said, You can almost hear his weariness. All this has come against me. He just feels so weak. God in his goodness came and restored him. And good providences that have come in his life. He, re he re revives weak sheep. And again, Christian, isn't that your experience? That your Christian walk has not been one of always scampering along so full of energy and following Jesus Christ. Our lives are just dotted by periods of weakness. But he didn't leave us. Because he's the good shepherd who restores his sheep. So if you come this evening and you're feeling just so weak or you feel you've been wandering, here's this shepherd. And this is how he deals with his sheep. He comes to restore them. Or if you're not yet a Christian, you're listening to this and you think, well, I could never go on in the Christian life. Well, you'd be right on your own, you couldn't. But there's this shepherd and he keeps on restoring his sheep. Right to the very end. He keeps us. So that's the first thing in our verse this evening. The good shepherd restores his sheep. But then there's a second thing for you to reflect on in your own life. Is that the good shepherd guides his sheep. The good shepherd guides his sheep. Maybe some of you know these words of verse. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That's the Christian's heart. We're, we're prone to wander. We're prone to wander off from the God that we love by his grace. Every sin we commit is a leaving of God's way. We we'll hear these sheep, and remember David was a shepherd in his early life. And he knew that there were animals that needed 24-hour supervision. Every moment of every day, these silly sheep need to be guided. They're so stupid that they'll trample the fresh pasture in an instant. They're so foolish that they'll dirty up the drinking water that they've been led to. They're so foolish that they'll follow other sheep into danger. Have you seen photographs of a, of a, of a sheep somehow perched up on the side of some mountain on a tiny little ledge? Like, how did it get there? Well, it's foolish. Saw some, some fresh grass and off it went. And it's in great trouble. David knew that sheep needed 24-hour guidance. That's what he'd done as a young man. And now as he thinks of God's work in his life, he says, that's my experience as I, as I love the Lord. He leads me in paths of righteousness. He, he, just like the shepherd, Jesus Christ leads his sheep in right paths. That's what righteousness really has the idea. A, a right path, a God's path. The path that's close to God, the path that honours God, the path that's God's way. And David says, this is my experience. He leads me in paths of righteousness. You see, the Christian knows that left to our own, we'll wander. And the Christian knows that Jesus Christ won't forsake them, but will guide his sheep in right paths. Psalmist writes in Psalm 118 and 107, verse 176, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. David says now here that this was his experience, that, that the Lord would lead him and guide him in right paths. That's his summary of his life. And they're beautiful words. Maybe you just need to think of those three words this evening. He leads me. Uh, the verb that's used there can be translated in the past tense. It can be translated in the present tense. And it, be, and it can be legitimately translated in the future tense. Well, isn't that your experience, Christian? Can't you say in your life that he has led me in my past in right paths. He, he kept me, 
He kept me going on when I was veering off. He, he put me back on track. He led me and guided me in paths of righteousness. Can't you say, Christian, this evening, that this is your experience right now? He's leading me in paths of righteousness. He's, he's, his Spirit is working in my life so that I have this desire to walk in His ways. And the Christian can say, this will be my tomorrow as well. He will guide me, He will lead me in paths of righteousness. Well, think of a sheep for a moment. Try and, well, try and imagine a sheep thinking. I know they don't think as we think. But try and imagine a sheep in the Middle East following the shepherd. And the pathway is steep. And the little path is twisting up into the mountains. And the sheep's thinking, maybe letting a few bleats out to a sheep alongside it. This is a difficult path. This is a, a hard path. They haven't been this way before. And the other sheep bleats back, but the shepherd is going in front. It's the right path. Follow on. Maybe you come as a Christian this evening on the pathway of your life. It's steep right now. It feels slippy underfoot. But as you hear the word of God, the shepherd goes in front of you. And, he, and David says, this is my experience. He leads me in paths of righteousness. The path of your life, Christian, as you listen to his word, will be a path of blessing, and that's where the Lord promises to lead the sheep. Whatever path your life actually has been, Jesus Christ has never forsaken you, and he can make even the, the foolish path that we have chosen. He can use that to, to steer us off onto the right path of following the Lord Jesus Christ as we realize our sin. David says, not only does he restore my soul, but he leads me in paths of righteousness. Maybe you, as a Christian this evening, think about your life and what will it be? What will tomorrow hold? What will the days ahead hold? Then hold this. He leads you in paths of of righteousness. He lead you in the perfect path. He lead you in the path that blesses you and honors him. He leads in paths of righteousness. This word righteousness it means really God's way. How does God guide his sheep in paths of righteousness? You're saying this evening, I, I want my life to be in this path. How do I get that? Well, we get the paths of righteousness from the Word of God. The, the Word of God's telling us, here's how the Lord wants us to live. And not yet a Christian, he says, the path is following me. It's entrusting your life to me. It's turning from sin and following me. And for the Christian, he says, the Bible that you have in your hand, that's the path for your life. Hear it, read it, take it in. He leads and he guides his people, sometimes Christians, get into all sorts of trouble. How will I know the will of God? Well, God says, he leads in paths of righteousness. You look at his word, you hear his word, and his sheep hear his voice. He guides his sheep. It doesn't matter of morality. We don't need to listen to the world to find out how we're to live. In these days, when everything seems to change, we say, well, what do the scriptures say? What does God say? That's the right path. That's the path of righteousness. In matters of life, when we've got decisions to make, we, we take them to the word of God and we ask, is, is, uh, what does God have to say about this? That's the path of righteousness. And it's the path of blessing for the sheep in Christ's flock. He's a restoring, guiding shepherd. He restores his sheep. He guides his sheep. But then thirdly and finally, we see that the good shepherd does all this for his own name's sake. Isn't that what it says? He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. And the reason, for his name's sake. 
So think of a shepherd in the Middle East or any time in any place. And uh, why? what's the shepherd's purpose? Well, the shepherd's purpose is to get wool from the sheep and eventually meat. That's his motivation or her motivation every day. I'm going to keep these sheep so that I can make something from them. Going to get their wool, going to get their meat. So, but what is it that motivates the good shepherd Jesus Christ? Well, look at it. He leads me in paths of righteousness. He restores my soul for his name's sake. He does it for himself. Now, you might initially think, well, that sounds very like the shepherd looking after his sheep and making sure they've got a good fleece and a good fat rump so that they can be slaughtered and he make money. But we need to be wise and we need to listen and understand God's word. Jesus Christ is never in the business of looking after his sheep in a selfish way. So we need never be hasty in thinking about this verse. He cares and nourishes his sheep for his own name's sake. The Lord Jesus Christ, and when you understand this, there are so many blessings come to your life. The Lord Jesus Christ is interested in the fame of his own name. The God of all glory, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, has this great desire to glorify his name. Now, if that were any mere human being, that would be the most despicable, arrogant thing imaginable. For we as human beings are flawed and sinful, but God, his son Jesus Christ, he's perfect. So when he desires the glory of his own name, there's no hint in it of selfishness or sin at all. This little phrase that David uses here for his name's sake, is, this isn't the only place it appears in the Bible. We sang of it in the previous psalm. It's mentioned over 200 times in the Bible that God works for his name's sake. We could say, actually, this because this great theme is threaded throughout all the Bible, we could say it's God's grand purpose in everything. I used to visit a, an elderly great aunt when I was going walking home from school every day and uh, when she came to our house and there was a nature program, no matter what the animal was, and maybe it was some odd a animal, she would, Auntie Belle would often say, well, what's the purpose of that? What's that for? Well, actually, it's for God's own glory. It's why he made everything for the glory of his name so that human beings would look up and say, Great is the Lord, worthy of all praise, so that the angels of heaven would bow, would bow down in eternal worship of him. He made everything for his glory. When he created this world, every little thing for the glory of God. When he made Adam and Eve, they were for the glory of God. And even when, the, when sin came into the world, that too, was for the glory of God. No man responsible for his sin, but it would lead to the exaltation and glory of God. For without the fall, the greatness of God's love and mercy and holiness and judgment would not be seen as it was after the fall. It's all for the glory of God the rescue, every person who's been converted today across this world, it's for the glory of God. Every human being today who has left the scene of this time and stood before the judgment of God and some cast into the everlasting darkness of hell, it's the glory of God, his greatness, his holiness, how awesome he is. In all God's action, his character is at stake. And it's why he makes his sheep lie down in green pastures. It's why he leads them beside still waters. It's why he restores their soul. It's why he leads in paths of righteousness for his own name's sake. He does it for his own glory. If you're a follower of his this evening, your life 
is for his glory. And that's the reason why if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you will make it to the end. Because it's for the glory of God that you were saved. And God's glory would be diminished if one of those whom the Father had given to the Son would not enter the, the fold of heaven. So all who are in Christ will be safe to the very end. Our greatest good is found in God's delight to glorify himself. That's why we pray for the, the rescuing of men and women from the guilt and power of sin, that God will be glorified. That's why we want to witness into this community ultimately. Oh, we want to see people know the wonder of following Jesus. We want God to be lifted up. And that's God's purpose. What's to be the purpose of your life, Christian? Well, you know what we're taught from little children. What is man's primary purpose? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And this desire of God for his own glory is the reason, Christian, you'll get to the end. It's the reason he restores you. It's the reason he cares for you. For he has this passion for his own glory. Well, maybe tonight someone listens and you're not yet a Christian yet. These truths of Jesus Christ, this great shepherd who restores lost sheep, this great shepherd who guides his sheep, is to draw you to him and to, for you to say, that's the shepherd I need. You see, the world has got other alternatives for people to follow, but there are none that bring this blessing that he does. There are none that restore. There are none that guide us to heaven but Jesus Christ. Well, this psalm, before it was mine or before it was yours, Christian, it was Jesus' psalm. And this was his statement of faith as the God-man walking on this earth. The Lord is my shepherd. He's going to keep me. He's going to steer and guide me in paths of righteousness that I lay down my life in the place of many. And he did it. And he loved this psalm. We come, God willing, next time to these wonderful, wonderful verses. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Can you imagine Jesus saying those? And he knows he's going to the valley of the shadow of death. He's committed to his Father and his God. For he has a great number of lost sheep to rescue. And you can be sure you're one of them. As you turn and hear his voice and follow him. He restores my soul. We're going to sing these words in the more familiar setting than the setting we used last Lord's Day evening. And there'll be some of these verses that not only would have spoken to you in the reading, but also in the singing of them. You'd hear the voices of others. And this is their testimony. The Lord's my shepherd. But think about the voice of Jesus also saying these words. And what they must have meant for him. Oh, he was restored from the grave. He walked on to the very end in the right path for the glory of God. So that you and I could be sheep in his flock. We sing these words to his praise.
for your son, the shepherd of his sheep, for his restoring grace. We thank you that he's the one who brings pardon and forgiveness, a new life, and the life of following Jesus Christ all our days. We thank you for the work of his spirit who convicts and converts us. We thank you, mighty God, that all of your sheep say, he restores my soul. Father, we thank you for the restoring of our souls that the shepherd has done today as we've heard his word, as we've sung his praise. And we pray that as we go into another week, we would continue to know his restoring grace. Lord, we acknowledge that there are things that are still broken about our lives. But we know that when he comes again, we'll be restored fully and finally, like him. We ask for grace to walk on with him. And if any haven't begun that journey, that the working of, in the working of your spirit, that they would do so this day. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of God, the Holy Spirit, be with you all. Amen.